Awesome. Hi, everyone. It is so awesome to be back at another PSB. Uh, this is, uh, I think, my 25th or 26th year coming to these meetings. Um, and it's always great to be in Hawaii. So I'm Sean Mooney. Um, uh, for those that you don't know me, I'm at the University of Washington. I'm Chief Research Information Officer of UW Medicine, our health system. Um, and uh, today what I'm going to do is tell you a bit about my journey to get there. I want to thank Terry for inviting me to give this talk. I hope that uh, you guys find it interesting and, and hearing a little bit about my journey trying to integrate research into a large academic medical center health, health system-y thing. The thing about PSB that's been so much fun about coming here for the last 25 years, I've been watching kind of that evolution that a lot of you who have been coming back have seen, where if you were here in 1997 and came to this meeting, you'd see sessions that were focused on things like, you know, pairwise or multiple sequence alignments or doing searches against sequence databases or structural genomics. Um, or protein structure analysis, that sort of thing. And over time, we've sort of evolved into, you know, looking at omics data and methods around omics data. And sessions have talked about the genome once the genome was sequenced. And then, uh, you know, and then we started talking about integrative and systems biology. We still talk a little bit about all these things, but this has, you know, been really a wonderful journey. And it's been really wonderful seeing that we've kind of moved toward more precision or translational medicine, as you've seen just from the talk that we just saw. And like almost all of the sessions, sessions are focused on this area. And then underneath all of this is quantitative methods, informatics, and I've loved the fact that this meeting's always had kind of an angle in the LC space for ethical, legal, uh, you know, social implications of, uh, you know, biocomputing and biomedical informatics. So um, for those of you that know my career, I have spent most of my career working on trying to predict pathogenic genetic variants. I started doing this as a graduate student when I was, a, uh, when I was at UCSF working for Terry Klein. And, um, and I continue to do this for most of my career. I've collaborated a lot with a number of people. The primary person I've worked with is Pedro Radovoyats, who's also a regular PSB attendee, but not here this year. And we've published more than 40 papers together, all focused in this space of trying to model biology and then predict how a mutation or a genetic variant on the genome would disrupt that biology and thereby cause disease. And you can read all about that, but I'm not going to talk about that in this talk very much other than to acknowledge that that's the work that we've been working on. Um, often in, these, in this paper, in a bunch of our papers, you'll see ROC curves that look like this, where we do some form of cross-validation. We compare our method to a bunch of other methods. We then have some validation set that wasn't used. It could be perspective, like, say, genetic variants that are or curated into ClinVar um, and um, that are cur curated into ClinVar later, like in the future, and, that's, and then we can show that our method is working better than, than others. Um, and I think a lot of folks follow this model, and you'll see a lot of papers in PSB that kind of do that, where you have data that, or some data set that's collected, you build a model with that data that's been, you know, very heavily or, or you know, well annotated, and then that model results in some form of, a, like, an ROC curve or some sort of an evaluation process where it's then, you know, if it's novel, it's on its own. If it's not novel, it's compared to other things, and then people write a paper, and that paper gets reviewed and published and, you know, perhaps in the PSB proceedings. But as we move toward precision medicine, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that that leaves a lot of open and unanswered questions if we do, um, uh, you know, if we write a paper in that way. So, you know, what happens if this model is implemented into a clinical workflow as clinical decision support? Doesn't matter if you're predicting genetic variation or patients in the EHR, you know, in the emergency room who are going to decline, or whether you're in an outpatient setting trying to predict patients that are clinically depressed. Um, you know, we don't really understand whether providers or how providers will use these methods. We don't understand whether it satisfies them. We don't understand whether it distracts them or whether patients benefit from it. Um, and does it show the value that we proposed when we wrote the paper and said that this method is more accurate than all of the other methods? And then finally, does it actually bring um, value to the health system? And so this made this. These questions, you know, about 15 years ago, started to make me ask, 
you know, how, how, I wanted to understand patients better. I was collaborating a lot with geneticists, and geneticists love sending me, you know, Excel, Excel spreadsheets or CSV files where the rows were probands, they were patients, the columns were genetic elements, and then the final column was the condition, and the condition was yes or no, like yes Parkinson's, no Parkinson's, whether the patients fit the, exclusion, the inclusion or exclusion criteria, and if you know, if you've ever met a pa Parkinson's patient, they're all different. And so yes and no wasn't enough. So I really thought that that was like the future, was like trying to understand phenotype better, trying to understand patients better. And so I started to, I was at a nonprofit private research institute that wasn't a health system, and I started to co collaborate with friends of mine, people who come to PSB actually, about trying to get access to clinical patient data. And again, I'm trained as a chemist, I'm not a provider, so this was all very new to me in a new world, and I was really excited about being able to, to do that. And I remember the day where I had a conversation, I won't name who that was that had that conversation, they're not here today, but they're often here, um, and they basically, after a long effort, told me that I couldn't get access to any patient data from their site. And, and that upset me. I wasn't angry at this person, but I was upset about the whole process because we'd been working together for a long time on this, and I didn't get access, and I literally, this is totally a true story, I went home that night and I started working on my CV because I was gonna get a new job working on trying to make clinical real world data more usable in an open data science world. And I, I used that CV that I worked on that night, started applying for jobs, and I was pr really, really surprised that a bioinformatics guy trained as a chemist started getting interviews to do this because I had no idea what EHR data looked like at that time, it's totally true. I went to the University of Washington as Chief Research Information Officer, I was the first person to do that, and that was awesome. Really great opportunity to jump in because a lot of, because we had a really, really great data resource and nobody was playing with it, which was great. University of Washington, just as background, it's a, this year our budget's gonna be, I think, around $9 billion. Uh, Bill is talking next, he can correct me. And I think about 55 to 60% of that budget is treating patients. We have three hospitals, we have, uh, we have primary care clinics in the Puget Sound region, we've got uh, a trauma center, a cancer center, all the kind of normal things that you would expect to see. We see about a little over a million patients a year, and um, we have an enterprise electronic health record system that we can use to serve, um, you know, we can deliver things like clinical decision support tools. And we have an awesome data platform with more than 30 years of data, more than five million patients, and we've been working very hard in my team to make that data usable for research, extracting concepts from text, de-identifying text, annotating social determinants of health, annotating environmental determinants of health, um, trying to improve outcome data, annotating mortality data, geocoding patients, that sort of thing, things that people do. But this is an operational resource, this database, uh, and it's used operationally, um, so it's fully identified, and it's ready to be, you know, if someone were to implement, say, a machine learning algorithm, it's actually really quite easy to implement it from a technical perspective, assuming that the health system and everybody else would allow you to do that. And so we started having conversations about, like, all the things that, this is just thought experiments, about what we would need to have in place if we were to try to implement AI methods, like, say, a machine learning method that works at the population level at the University of Washington Health System, what would that actually take? And, um, and so we, um, we uh, kind of wrote all of those things down. Like, and and this, is, this is just sort of a laundry list, and I'm not gonna go into detail on everything, but we, you, know, you need data, of course. You need data governance. You need data access. You need like HIPAA computing where you can run things. You need that software to deliver you know, any sort of method or tool that's gonna have results. You need to be able to interface the data, the model, and the, and the software that delivers it. You need to be able to have compliance. You need to be able to have clinical governance and be in clinical governance. Um, and then you have to be able to have some sort of predictive analytics or machine level governance as well that can oversee which methods you impl implement. And then you have to have the tools to implement them and you have to have, you know, once they're implemented, you have to be able to oversee them and try to, you know, monitor them over time. And, you know, all of us, me included, throughout our careers, like, we're told to be autonomous agents and independent. We're, like, really asked to write our first grant, our R01. We're told to stay away from administrative things. We're told to be bottom-up. Health systems don't work that way. They're top-down. 
We have committees. Those committees go up to CEOs or presidents, et cetera, that kind of oversee things. And it's totally the opposite of everything we've ever done. And the biggest mistake that I see that investigators do when they try to get something installed is they bring that autonomous, I wrote my R01 kind of approach to the health system, and it doesn't work, and they get frustrated. So what we did was we started to build a team. And I got very little startup. I actually had more startup at my previous job when I actually moved into the UW um, uh, that was left over, but that, whatever, that doesn't matter. But I, I started to try to build a team. And, um, and with the goal of putting in place the pieces to support operational IT to do implementation of you know, data-driven methods in a secure, compliant, ethical way. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of those te the teamwork that we have done. So the first thing I mentioned was at the top was patient data governance and use. We didn't know how to make decisions around sharing data. If someone from the College of Engineering came to us with a USB drive and said, I want all of your patient data, we had no way to make a decision other than me saying no or sending an email to our president and saying, can you please say no for me so I can say no. And, um, and so that was kind of the first thing that we sort of focused on, was building a team of people that could query and deliver data and do it compliantly, but also building the governance so that we knew how to make decisions and when to make decisions and what kind of our values were about how we shared data. Um, we also worked on building a team for doing infrastructure, both in the cloud, kind of building architecture in the cloud, as well as building infrastructure on-prem that was HIPAA compliant, very focused and specific to research activities that were helping them. We also did a bunch of clinical trials things. I'm not going to talk about clinical trials because for some reason they always seem to be kind of separate in these conversations. Um, but we also have lots of infrastructure for clinical trials. Again, I'm not going to talk about clinical trials. Um, and we have an EDC system for collecting data, basically form data. Uh, we use REDCap. Probably many of you are familiar with REDCap. Our REDCap instance is like a headache. It's so big. It's you know, 30, 40,000 projects at this point. We've had probably, I don't know, 20,000 active users, and we get more than 1,000 unique logins every week. And it's a really big system, and it's hard to keep going, and some days, you know, I wake up in the morning and I get an email that someone tried to send 120,000 emails through REDCap to patients and it, it closed it and everything got blocked and nothing's working. Um, and then finally, the most important thing, that last mile, is Epic. It's like, how do we implement into the EHR? And so we started sending people to Epic, getting them trained in Epic, and getting them embedded in the Epic clinical IT team so that they, if someone wanted to run pragmatic research in Epic, We'd have someone who had the bandwidth and the priority to do that. All right, let's talk a little bit about data. So those are the teams that we built. And let's talk a little bit about data governance. Very early on, I sat down. I, sent, I talked to our vice dean for research and graduate education, who doesn't normally work in the health system. But I convinced him, he's retired, but I convinced him at the time that this was something important to do. And uh, he agreed. And so what we did is we identified all the leadership in the health system that we thought would be important and in the university to think about these data governance issues. And we convened the leaders that would do this, the chief research information officer, that's me, um, and I chaired it with the director of research IT who reports to me, um, the chief data officer, the, the director of the human subjects division, the director of compliance, the risk QI people, the uh, uh, enterprise health records people, those are the people that scan like PHQ-9s and other patient reported out comes or share data when patients ask for their data. The vice dean for research, the director of business for the clinical operations, the business people, and then, um, of course, our council. And we started, got together and started asking ourselves questions. We developed guiding principles, like what are our principles and values around data sharing? And we articulated them. We had documented them. Um, and this ended up in like any sort of official document that we developed. Um, uh, you know, something I haven't mentioned, I just mentioned really quickly. We got our CEO to charge us for everything that we did, because having the CEO's backing enabled us to actually get people in the room together. It was really helpful. Um, and um, so we developed guiding principles. We identified what we thought were the organizational risks. We drafted policies, and we, um, uh, we changed our notice of privacy practices that the patients see, and we developed standardized DUAs for data sharing. And then we strategized and implemented what we would call operations um, and helped fundraise for that. We built a matrix, they call this internally the Mooney matrix, um, 
but uh, what this is is basically the, the ro rows of this matrix or the sensitivity of the data and the columns of this matrix are where someone sits. Do they sit in the health system? Do they sit in the school of medicine? Do they sit outside of the school of medicine? Do they sit in an organization we have an agreement with or are they outside of everything else? And how sensitive the data is and you go to that right cell, it kind of tells you what that individual needs to do to get access to the data and how that process would happen. So we had kind of, we had data governance, we got approval, we developed a committee, that committee actually still meets every day, every month, and we talk a lot about all the interesting things that go on in the world around data sharing uh, in our organization. And we also, you know, in parallel, we're working on tools for data access. We wanted investigators to have a way to access data. We developed a tool called LEAF. This was developed by Nick Dobbins, who is my pr principal architect on my team, really, really talented developer. Um, has a PhD now, he's largely independent, um, and he developed an application called LEAF, which we implemented. If you've used, used I2B2, it's kind of like I2B2, but it's web-based, um, but it doesn't prescribe a data model. And that's why people like it. It's really, really easy to implement, and it kind of automatically glues on to whatever patient-centered data that you have, um, and it's really easy to use. It's open source, it's free to use. Um, since it's been in production at the UW, we've run, we've trained hundreds of investigators on how to use it. We've done tens of thousands of queries on it locally at the UW, both clinical queries as well as uh, research ones. It de-identifies data on the fly for researchers so they don't need an IRB to use it. Um, and it's now in place, or at least being tested, at a lot of universities around the world um, and other research projects. In fact, I had a postdoc take a faculty position. He asked to access, access patient data, and the first thing they did was train him how to use LEAF, which was awesome. Uh, fitting in with the themes of this conference, I'll say that that was a generative AI picture of Nick. Um, the, uh, the, um, so LEAF is really awesome, is I think easy to use, it's really cool, it can export data if your institution allows it, it allows for really awesome queries, and now we've developed a large language model version of LEAF, uh, this should be an animation of it, where you can take inclusion and exclusion criteria, it then parses that data and will do a query against our enterprise data warehouse, it will come up with a cohort for you, and that cohort um, we have shown is the same people, for example, that would enroll in a clinical trial if you were using clinicaltrials.gov inclusion exclusion criteria, because we know who's enrolled. But it, we've also shown that, or Nick has shown, that this is, um, uh, that this uh, tool is better than a human doing those same exact queries. Um, like every other organization that does this for a living, we're very interested in clinical text. Um, we have well over 100 million individual pieces of text, messages, uh, narrative, clinical narrative text, uh, reports, like everything that you would kind of expect. And so we've set up pipelines to do de-identification, extract biomedical concepts and clinical findings, as well as annotate social determinants of health. And, and we have a faculty member in our department, Mila Ayetis again, who I pay out of the research budget a little bit to help kind of support all of this platform that we have for extracting this. And I'll talk more about this in a second. Um, we're very interested in synthetic data. So um, I love this website. Um, it's getting a little rusty now because everybody knows what synthetic data is. They didn't when I first started talking about this. But if you go to thispersondoesnotexist.com, you can get a fake, you know, a fake image of a person. And we like to think we could do the same thing with patient data. Um, and we're huge fans of these common data models like OMOP. So we translate our clinical data to OMOP and then we can translate that to synthetic data. And we think that synthetic data is less risky than dis disseminating de-identified data, HIPAA de-identified data, because I personally think that there is significant or at least non-trivial risk of re-identification of patients from data that's been safe harbor de-identified from clinical data. Um, we published a paper with Bad Nalen's group in Nature Communications uh, a couple of years ago now um, looking at building a model for synthetic data about the balance between the utility, like how useful is synthetic data, and how privacy protecting is synthetic data. So if you're really interested in synthetic data, I highly recommend reading that. Okay, so uh, I've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to go relatively quick through some of this. Um, uh, then we started, so we've got this team, we've got um, our doors are open, we've got governance, we've embedded ourselves into governance, 
Um, and then we started to do things with this. So for example, Miliha and Nick and others developed a pipeline for annotating social determinants of health. We showed that the, uh, if you look at EPIC, um, um, if you look in EPIC, we annotated, extracted like alcohol use, tobacco use, drug use, employment status, living status, like homelessness. Um, and if you uh, looked at what was actually structured in EPIC, we see more, and we started working with our chief me medical information officer's office to structure and embed that back into EPIC and present it back to providers. This is an ongoing project that we're working on today. We also did fun things that actually have, you know, that aren't maybe that clinically useful, but were fun. Like we worked on visualizations of data. So what we're looking at here is ICD-10, I think. Um, and we looked at all of our emergency room activity and diagnoses in our emergency room. And then we did basically the same thing as a gene set enrichment analysis, like you might do in bioinformatics from an RNA-seq experiment. And we asked what uh, diagnosis codes were enriched or depleted based on certain periods of time. And what we're looking at here is summer enrichment. And for Seattle, like this makes tons of sense. You've got your water boating accidents. You've got your vehicle accidents. You've got your climbing accidents. You've got your fireworks accidents. Uh, you've got your snake bites and your spider bites. And you've got your motorcycle and your bicycling accidents. It makes total sense. Um, we also looked at individual days. And one of the kind of interesting things that I'll say this again, this isn't really that interesting clinically, but we kind of thought it was fun. It was a rotation student a rotation student that worked on this. Is we looked at enrichment of certain diagnosis codes that were unusual for individual days. And this is the top 15 or so days that we saw that came out as being really, really interesting and identifiable for all of the 30 years of data we had for our emergency rooms. And at, very interestingly, a weather event shows up in the top 10, the Hanukkah Eve windstorm that Seattle saw because a lot of people were injured in their emergency rooms with carbon monoxide poisoning. And the other one was earthquakes, the Nisqually earthquake that happened in Seattle is also top 15. Really interesting that a weather event is showing up highly on our list of emergency room stuff. Okay, so um, Epic and Cerner and all the EHR vendors are really excited about implementing machine learning, real machine learning models into care, and that's happening today, uh, whether we're watching that or not. It's, it is happening. And um, I want to give you kind of an example of something that we looked at. We looked at patient no-shows. Patients miss clinic visits. It's expensive. It's obviously expensive when they miss visits. Nationally, maybe as many as 20% of all patients miss visits. If we just look at our data, we see about 14%. And um, we want to uh, you know, spend resources to make sure patients get there. And we have two interventions that we can do. One, we can text them or send them a Uber or call them or whatever. Or we can solve it the airplane problem way is overbook clinics. So we took the data of the model that was running um, in our system and we looked at uh, we looked at things like the annotation of race of a patient and asked, are they similarly accurate? And what we see is that the, race are, that the models are differentially accurate based on the annotated race. So that means that if you overbook clinics, you're also going to be differentially overbooking clinics differentially accurately based on race as an annotation. And so that was something that uh, you know, gave us pause and made us think. All right. I'm going to finish talking a little bit about the weather forecast, because I've been thinking about the weather forecast for about 10 years, um, and over the last 10 years that I've been at the UW, because UW has a great atmospheric sciences department. And I'll tell you a little bit about why here in, um, in a second. In Seattle, people love to watch the weather. Nobody loves to watch the weather more than Seattleites, I swear. It's totally true. Like twi The Twitter feed for, for Seattle weather is more popular and exciting than like Trump's Twitter feed. And, um, yeah, if you probably remember, like the old newspaper, um, uh, the old newspaper uh, uh, weather forecast, where you had a list of all the temperatures. Um, this is from London because I couldn't find one from Seattle. These are actually really hard to find on the internet. And um, and here at the bottom, they show you kind of the low pressure lines on a you know a small line drawing. This is for like the this is super low resolution, right? That's the entire Atlantic Ocean there, and. Um, and uh, it's the entire Atlantic Ocean, and we're like supposed to like interpret the weather. I still, like some of these, I still don't know how to read. Like the, the one that always had lines with like the triangles on the lines. You remember those? It was a long time ago. Anyway, I never knew how to read those. I still don't. Um, and, um, and that was, you know, and they had a meteorologist that right, would look at satellite data, look at like national forecasting data, et cetera. And they would come up with and write up what the forecast would be for that certain region, and that's what we would, would see or read. Um, 
you know, later, universities like the University of Washington started doing forecasting. Um, and you can go online and look at these old high resolution forecasts that UW produced where um, they would say, here's temperature, here's weather, et cetera, and have these maps. And those maps then started being used for, um, for forecasting. But as many of you probably are aware, today it's totally different. Today we have global weather forecasting models. So there's a small number of sites around the world that run all the time or running simulations. Basically every six hours they're running all the time and um, they're very high resolution and they're global and they run out to 10 or 15 days into the future. They release data every six to 12 hours. I'm showing data on the European one. There's an American one, the GFS, which is kind of this animation that I'm showying. And they run ensemb they're ensembles of models. So they have like, f in the case of the European, they have 51 different simulations that are running at any one time. And then every six hours or so, they release bulk data of what those simulations are. So the old model was local meteorologists is kind of interpreting data, kind of then writes the forecast. The new model is a handful, a very small number of handful of models, of centers, simulate the global weather, and then we build literally visual analytics tools that pull data out of those tools to look at the local model of how we do. And then the local people, the local meteorologists, like know how these different global models work in that different region. Like sometimes the American one is better than the European one, and sometimes it's not, and they kind of compete with each other. So for example, here's Mount Rainier at the National Park and showing snowfall over the next two weeks this is actually there. And each of the rows that you see here are the 51 different uh, simulations. And you can see the mean average accumulation of snow where it's predicting that there's gonna be 80 inches of snow over the next two weeks, which is surprisingly normal for, for Mount Rainier. We can also do it for like temperature for the region based where we extract like here's all the temperature anomalies. That's the difference from normal. Um, in the region. You could see that yesterday they were forecasting that Seattle is going to be really cold next week, which is unfortunate because I'm going home. Um, and so this is super interesting. How did medicine like get so far behind? <laughs> like they're really like kicking everybody's rear end. So we actually thought about this and we're like, what if we were to try to do forecasting on a health system? Like let's try to actually do that. And we've got all the team together to do it. And I talked a little bit about this last year and I only have three minutes left, so I'm going to be really pretty quick. Um, but we did it. We built an infrastructure where we can put machine learning models that predict the future onto our live EHR data that's used operationally. We got the health system to agree to it, we got the IRB to agree to it, and we got all the technical pieces and we believed that we could do it. And we partnered with SageBio Networks to do that. Um, we, um, and we did it kind of in a sneaky way to help us be able to do it uh, in a way that was compliant. Um, sneaky is maybe the wrong word. We built it in a way that, was, uh, that didn't share data. And the way that we did that was we started by building the, an exact replica of our infrastructure in the cloud in AWS, but we populated it with synthetic data instead of real data. And we then um, built kind of an honest broker of machine learning models to enable the machine learning models to talk to that data. And we have a workflow language, oops, a workflow language where the data scientist can tell the model in the Dockerized container world what to do when it sees the data. And the data's in a standard data model, so everybody knows what it looks like and they can play with that. Once they showed us they could do that, we then had a backdoor where we could take the models ourselves, pull them down, and apply them to the real data and do that. So we decided to run an experiment um, uh, and we wanted it to kind of be like an open data science experiment. So we said, well, why don't we open the doors to this and train people to predict 180 day all cause mortality. There were a number of papers that were out there. Death is very quantitative. It's easy to measure. We felt we had good data to do it. And um, there were other competing methods out there. So we thought that that would be a good thing to do. So we asked data scientists using this infrastructure to predict 180 day all cause mortality on our patients. We had a leave out data set that we could use for ranking the models. Um, we had people submitting models. We had models running. We then validated them. We had a leaderboard and we ran this for a few months. And then we stopped the challenge, closed everything down. And of course, we waited 180 days to see which models predicted the future the best. So we've got ROC curves, precision recall curves, the best model had about 50% precision and 50% recall, which is kind of scary if you think about it. Um, and uh, 
uh, and we ran it. We learned a ton. You can read about the papers that we did. One of the things that I think, I'm gonna go back to looking at demographics or basically po patient populations that we really cared about, um, but what we see is that um, the, uh, uh, if we look at like say annotated race, this works for gender, age, and some other things too, is that highly accurate models differ in accuracy on specific populations underneath the hood. So if two vendors come to you and say, our model is both has an AUC of 0.95, it may actually work underneath the hood very differently on different populations, really important. So we're, we're actually running a dementia challenge, but we're actually interested in running a real like weather forecasting challenge where you have a big giant matrix of rows of patients and columns of events moving into the future and having people predict that. I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna talk about anything else except for to thank my team um, and to thank all the people that we work with and fund us. Thank you.